Good evening, guys. Uh, I'm going to kick this off by talking about velocity-based training. Uh, this is something that I know a lot of people have not uh, ventured into yet. Uh, when I speak of velocity-based training, I'm not just talking about speed strength or working on speed in the weight room. We're actually going to talk about using technology to monitor velocity and, and uh, power and how we, how we open windows into new measures of intensity by using this technology. So as a brief outline of where we're going to go, we will first look at some training theory, some basic training theory, and how this is going to underlie uh, the relevancy for velocity-based training. We'll then talk about intensity in the weight room, how we, how we currently use it in traditional methodology, many of which has, many of these traditional methods have benefits. Uh, I think they're tried and true benefits. But they also come with drawbacks, and we're going to look at those drawbacks and look at how we can maybe circumvent them or work around them with velocity-based measures. Then we'll go into the meat and potatoes of this presentation and actually talk about velocity-based training and the applications of that training, how we can actually work it into our day-to-day -day routines in a way that is beneficial and providing us with useful and actionable data. And then finally, I'm going to wrap this up with a brief discussion of logistics because I think it's very important to understand that anytime we implement a new technology or a new training methodology that there may be uh, hassles or roadblocks in the way that prevent you from implementing it and I'll talk about some of those and how we can get around them to better use this technology. So very briefly I wanted to discuss training theory. I think this is something that everyone in this room is probably very comfortable with discussing, uh, especially this idea of the importance of volume and intensity. These two metrics, volume and intensity, are the two most important variables when it comes to the success or failure of a training plan. And what we're going to see is that over the course of a year or a month or whatever the length of your training cycle is, the manipulation of these two variables, more so than perhaps any other variables in the training plan, will have the bi biggest impact on the success or failure of that training plan. Now, volume is relatively simple to understand. It is reps done, it is foot contacts, it is miles run, meters, meters covered in a sprint. Those are all relatively simple metrics, easy to count. Intensity, however, excuse me, intensity, however, is a little bit more difficult to measure. With intensity, uh, we get into contextual based issues. Is it intense because I'm fatigued? I'm at a higher RPE, even though it's at a relatively low percentage of my maximal performance. Uh, we get into issues with intensity being something that is harder to measure, like velocity, like power output. So there are issues with intensity that we need to consider um, and recognize the limitations of traditional methodology. Before we go there, let's look at intensity in the weight room. When we talk about intensity in the weight room, we are primarily talking about load, how much weight you slap on the bar. Now that works, that works really well. Uh, however, the problem is that it also limits us. It limits us. Load on the bar is really just a measure of, it's a correlate of the force output of that athlete. It's a correlate. It's a pretty good correlate at high 1RMs or high percentage of max. But at lesser percentages, it's not a very good correlate. Um, it's frequently used in percentage-based methods. How many in here use percentage-based me methodology in their training? So 80, using 85% on the bar, 90% in your prescription. Quite a few of you. It's, it's pretty common to see that type of prescription. Um, some coaches are moving towards using RPE as a measure of intensity, and this works, but it is obviously an inexact science. Athletes can cheat the system by uh, for example, you prescribing an 8 out of 10 on the RPE scale, your lazy athlete is going to put on less load than that perceived exertion would prescribe. Your meathead athlete, the one that wants to push hard and max every day, might actually push at a, 
a 10 out of 10 on that particular day. So there's ways to kind of cheat that system as well. Now, there are benefits to traditional methodologies in the weight room using a load-based or mass-based system. It's very easy to track, right? We can count kilograms on the bar, no problem. It's very easy to track. We can count percentage of your 1RM. Uh, it's logistically very simple. It's no problem to take a weight off the rack and put it on the bar. Super simple to do. That makes it very easy to use. No additional equipment is required. And again, we're taking a lot of the barriers for entry out when we do that. <clears throat> load as a correlate of intensity, as I've mentioned before, works great at near maximal loads. So if we are in the range of 85 plus percent of our 1RM, we can, be pretty safe, we can pretty safely assume that that athlete's intent or their athlete's effort is close to a maximal effort. However, at lower percentages in load, we can't, we can't ensure that the athlete's force output is necessarily what we're looking for. For example, I might tell an athlete that I want them to give 100% effort even if there's 40% load on the bar, but there's no way to ensure that that's actually the case. The only way to actually ensure that the force output is matching what I'm prescribing is to put a higher load on the bar because otherwise, if they don't match it, they won't be able to move the load, right? At lesser loads or extremely submaximal loads, it's easy to just go through the motions. We've also seen that it's excellent for improving maximum strength. And that is very important, but as we're going to see in just a little bit here, maximum strength is not the end-all be-all. Now, let's move forward and look at some of the drawbacks of traditional methodology, traditional mass-based loading. Load on the bar is a great correlate for force output, but only when the load on the bar is relatively high, so somewhere in that 85 plus percent range. And what we're actually going to see, and this is confirmed by force plate analysis, is that load on the bar is not necessarily the best indicator of force output and is certainly not the best indicator of power output. And that's, that's what I was getting at before. You can go through the motions at 40% or you could actually produce more force at 40% than you do at 85% if we really get after it. It's actually possible to produce more force and certainly more power. In a lot of activities, we're going to see that peak power output is achieved at somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 60%. However, in the past, we've had no way of confirming where peak power output is actually occurring unless you have a $5,000 to $10,000 force platform at, at your facility. Now, most of us don't have that act type of access, so there's no way to accurately assess how fast or how much power that athlete is moving. I think most of us as coaches get a feel for what the bar speed is. You perhaps get a little bit more comfortable with noting what the bar speed is, especially on activities like Olympic lifts. And you can maybe have a good eye for telling whether that athlete is moving fast or slow relative to from day to day or from set to set. But I can tell you from first-hand experience using both force platforms as well as a variety of velocity-based measures that even our eye, and I, I feel like fairly confident that I have a, a fairly astute eye for these things, you miss a lot of things. We can't actually quantify it with our eye. We get a feel for it, but it's hard to quantify, and oftentimes we're wrong. Now, one of the things that is really critical to understand and underlies the importance of velocity-based training is that maximum strength, which is best developed through traditional loading, maximum strength is extremely important, but power output is what wins games. I think we've all had athletes who are the strongest in the gym, but they're not the best players on the field. And this divergence is often due to the fact that they are weight room strong, but they can't express that force very quickly. They're not powerful, they're not fast. So it doesn't help us very much if there is not this direct correlation between force and power. We need to create a bridge somewhere. So the solution for this really is in velocity-based training. With velocity-based training, 
we can take away a lot of the drawbacks of mass-based loading. We can take away a lot of the drawbacks because now we're able to actually see velocity and power output and these open different windows for us in terms of looking at intensity. We're not limited to look at intensity by just the load on the bar or the percentage of load on the bar or the RPE. Those are all kind of Di uh, directly associated with how much weight we put on the bar. But as we've seen, how much weight we put on the bar is not necessarily a great indicator of power output or of velocity or of force produced. So velocity-based training allows us to move forward and look at uh, new measures.